used to be in this reckoning I know I will never be All my death left for dead beneath the water I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world And I know
Good morning, church. If you could please stand with us and uh, sing some worship to the Lord. The love of God is greater far than tongue can pay. Can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bow down with care. God gave his son to. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean still? And where the sky of 
parchment made Where every stop on earth a quill And every man a scribe by trade To write the love of God above Will drain the ocean dry Nor could the scroll contain the whole Though stretched from sky to sky Thank you. Greet one another this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met I was breathing the night alive All my failures I tried Uh, just a reminder for everybody, there will be Sunday school this morning, but no evening services. Pastor and Sue have been under the weather this week, so no evening service this week. Um, Camp Quest uh, Wednesday and Guys and Girls Club on Wednesday night. Uh, evening school of the Bible Thursday, and then Saturday, there will be a soup and chili supper family game night here at the church. Begin at 5 p.m., there's a sign-up sheet out on the table. Also this month for Operation Christmas Child, we are collecting fashion accessories. Uh, Cindy said, think sunglasses, bracelets, necklaces, necklaces etc. The donation tote is out there by the table also. And Romaine uh, asked uh, if anybody can help with snacks for Camp Quest. There's a sign-up sheet on the table also. And that's it for announcements. Gentlemen, come forward for our offering. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, thank you for the beautiful sunshine today. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for us and what you will do for us. 
uh, please allow us to use these gifts wisely in your name. Amen. You're turning over tables and calling for return to our lives upon the altar, the things we did at first. You're clearing out the temple, you're cleaning up the dirt, for we are your territory, Lord, we are your church. Please stand with us again and sing. Be done. 
Father, not my will, but yours be done. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Samuel verse chapter 2 verse 2 says there is none holy like the Lord for there is none beside you there is no rock like our God worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise that could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you.
as you've noticed, Pastor's not here this morning. He's not feeling well yet. He's recovering. Sue came down and not feeling well, so they decided to stay away this morning. I, and I hear there's a lot of others as well that aren't feeling it's that winter season. There's a lot of stuff going around. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we get started. <clears throat> Father, I just thank you for, for your love for us. I thank you for what you've done for us on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, I just pray that in our lives, is the busyness of it, it seems sometimes that we may never forget the love that you shared to us there and the hope and the promise we have of that eternal glory with you one day. And Lord, may this always be a part of our lives and reflect in all the things we do. And Lord, again, we pray for Pastor and Sue this morning to help them as they're recovering, help them to get over the flu and this bug that's with them, and for the others as well in our church that are suffering with it, that they may go through it with ease and, and recover and continue on. And Lord, this morning especially we pray for Shana, that you would be with her as we continue to pray for her continuing illnesses and the troubles she has, Lord, that you would just be with her and bless her in a special way this week. I pray for Linda Robles this morning as she's suffering with a diverticulitis. And, and Lord, just be with her and give her your comfort and your hand upon her during this time and the, the pain that goes with that. And Lord, I know there's many others. We have a special request and the needs in our life, oh Lord, that you would be with our, and our, each one of us in a special way. And Lord, now this morning, I just pray for the service ahead that you would be with us, be with us in it. And, and Lord, that through the message that Stephen brings, that you may challenge our hearts, that you may encourage us as we go forth in this week ahead, Lord. And Lord, we just give all thanks and Praise in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all again. So this week, I have decided that it's no longer an excuse to just say I'm not a handyman. When stuff needs to be fixed around the house or when things need, when things are going on with the car or whatever it is, I usually just say I'm not a handyman and I'll get somebody else to do it. So I decided it's not good enough and with this new mentality, I had to stop ignoring the four inches of water that are in the tub after you take a shower. Pretended as long as I could that that wasn't there, I don't see it, it does drain. So what's the problem? Well, I decided, you know what? Handyman Steven now, he takes care of that. The, the bathtub clogs, we're going to take care of business. So <clears throat> I decided with no warning to Emily to box, you know, dust that because it hasn't been open in a minute. Take out my screwdriver, and I'm, un, I'm unclogging the drain. Not really sure where to go from there, but the, the cap thing is off. The screw is out. Emily happened to be on the phone with my mom. My mom said, oh, the best thing you can do is baking soda and vinegar. Does anybody know this? Brand new information. It like, it, it, like there's this whole like fizzy, like it, it reminded me of a science experiment. Like, did anyone do the volcanoes that had like the fizzy like things shot out? Never did that. That's apparently everyone did except for me. This chemical reaction you can create, I could do, I had a mini volcano with the baking soda and the vinegar. Well, it was making me think of other science experiments I did. One of my favorite in elementary school was we dissected a pig's heart. Did you know that a pig's heart, I mean, coincidentally, they have the same maker, though not a human heart, is pretty similar. So as far as uh, dissecting goes, and, and we were able to look at uh, the different vessels and chambers to better understand the human heart. 
One of my favorite dissections ever. That became much more personal, you know, because this information, okay, this is how the heart functions, became much more personal when years later in 2015, our son Nolan would be born with heart defects. So now that information of how the heart works becomes a lot more relevant and personal to my life. Well, there's a, a science experiment, if you will, a test in scripture about the human heart. But it's not the, the cardiovascular muscle that pumps blood uh, uh, from the lungs to the body, that gets oxygenated blood throughout your body. But I'm talking about that inner seat. Your intellect, your will, and your emotions, your inner man, your inner person. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And we'll look at this science experiment together. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. As you turn there, we're, we're jumping over Ecclesiastes 1, but what you missed is, it starts by saying the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Our best guess is this is Solomon. He fits the bill. All the things that you're going to see Solomon has done uh, in his resume in Ecclesiastes. Uh, coincidentally, I didn't do this on purpose, but last time I was here, we talked about the slow decline, the slow falling away from God of Solomon, uh, that it's not, that it's a drift, that if you are drifting, you are drifting away from the Lord, not towards the Lord, that our natural composition as fallen human beings is we drift away from the Lord. So here, and we, we talked about you know, Solomon accumulating mass amounts of wealth, and he and, and women and con he had 300 wives or 700 wives, 300 concubines, and that they were women who worshipped other gods. And eventually, his heart fell away from the Lord. Well, what I hope here in Ecclesiastes, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and I believe that maybe this was Paul's last repentant reflection. Not Paul, Solomon. Did I say Paul that whole time? Okay, good. I was like, no one stop me, Solomon. You can tell I preach from Paul a lot. Solomon, Solomon's last repentant reflection. So we find out his name uh, is most likely Solomon is the teacher. And this is how Solomon starts Ecclesiastes 1. Absolute futility. Does anybody have vanity of vanities? Vanity of vanities. Emptiness. Meaning, or anyone might have meaningless of meaningless. He is giving a description of what he calls life under the sun. Life on this earth, according to him, he finds it meaningless, empty. Uh, my Christian standard has futility. This is a word that means no substance. Empty. That he finds that life on this earth, in and of itself is empty. So we, we see this put to the test. And I know we, so the Lord's going to break us down and build us back up. So don't be too scared. We're going to get there. He con conducts a test, he says. Let's look at chapter 2. I said to myself, go ahead, I will test you with pleasure. I will test you. So he is conducting this Science experiment on the heart. Now, he's not testing pleasure. He's testing himself if pleasure is his end goal. Is where he's, he's testing himself against the bad answers that the world has to offer. That, that if we take the Lord out of the equation. So not only is he doing a science experiment, he's also playing pretend. Anyone remember playing pretend that pretend that you have? And I, we even asked this in my work office just for fun. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Last night, uh, our nine-year-old Jackson, his cousin, his cousin Eli, and, uh, you know, of course, being the monsters that we are, made them turn off the TV and the video games because we're awful and cruel. Uh, you know, parents, you all have to be that, the bad guy, too. Uh, but then we hear them chit-chatting because they're not quite falling asleep. And they were playing pretend that if they had a time machine, what would they do? And uh, 
Jax's cousin Eli, well, really my cousin's son, he said, if I had a time machine, I would go stop all bad things from happening. And his first one, and I thought that was a great answer, but then he said, I would stop George Washington from getting shot, which is so close, but George Washington died of a throat infection, so so close. Actually, in all the battles he was in, he was never once shot, but Eli had the right idea that he wanted to save George Washington. He also said that he would save Martin Luther King Jr., and Jax's response was, yeah, he's awesome. So they're playing pretend of what would they do if they had a time machine. Solomon here is inviting us to pretend that this is all there is. So he's going off of the assumption from now, if this is all there is, life under the sun, earth bound only, earth focused only, if this is all there is, which we know it's not, but let's pretend if this is all there is, it's meaningless. It's empty. The first bad answer he'll explore is pleasure. Pleasure. We could sum that up in the word, and here's your blank, appetite. Get all the pleasure that you can. Appetite. So uh, Solomon here is not just dipping his toes in the water, but he is jumping straight in. He says, I will test myself with pleasure. Enjoy what is good. But it turned out to be futile. He said, I gave myself over to the full extent that I could of pleasure but I found out it was futile. It was vanity. It was emptiness. This word, so vanity of vanities, it, repetition is a magnifier in the Bible. So think holy of holies means a super mega holy place. Vanity of vanities means a super mega squat. Nothing. The word here is the Hebrew word hebel, which means breath. So you know how it's been like hot, cold, hot, cold? When it's cold enough, and you can see your breath, the mist from your mouth, that's hebel. Or, or if you are cold enough and you want to go make some hot chocolate, the steam, the vapor that's rolling off of your cup, that's hebel. It's breath, it's mist, it's vapor. He's saying, I tested pleasure, I gave myself to whatever pleasure I want, and it was breath. It was empty, there's no substance and it was fast. Anyone in here could ask a person older than them, isn't life just going fast? Every generation will tell the next ones, even I'm feeling that, life is fast, is it not? Life flies by, how is it already? 2024. This life is, is quick, and if all you're looking for is pleasure out of life, it's empty. That, that there's nothing to hold on to. It's like breath. It's like the vapor off the cup. He says, I said about laughter. It's one form of pleasure. <clears throat> one form of pleasure. It's madness, or that's like not having one's own mind. I said about pleasure. What does this accomplish? I explored with my mind the pull of wine on my body. Though my mind still guided me with, with wisdom and how to grasp folly until I could see what is good for people to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. So I gave myself to laughter and pleasure and all forms of even let wine and not just a little bit of wine in moderation, but wine just have its way with me. And I found it's empty it's meaningless. It has no substance to it. And he asked the question, what does it accomplish? The implied answer is nothing. If, you're, if your one chief goal in life is to shun discomfort and only find comfort, it is going to be empty and accomplish absolutely 
nothing. Here's the big issue. Something will be the center of gravity in your life. Something. Something will be God, adored, disciple. Something will be at the center. And if it's pleasure, Solomon says it accomplishes nothing. Now, now mind you, Solomon does say, I'm giving myself over to pleasure completely, over to my appetite. Whatever appetite that I have for pleasure, I'm going to let myself have it. But I still had my mind. He still has enough wherewithal to say that I'm looking for meaning. Most people who give their life over to pleasure do not still have that attitude. They do not still have wisdom. Solomon is banking uh, this teaching on the assumption that we all, universally, every single human being, we all want significance. Don't we? Just want my life to matter. I just want what I do here to mean something. Unless you give your life over to pleasure and you numb yourself far enough that you can pretend that you don't care, that life doesn't matter. Does that make sense? If, if you give yourself over to pleasure enough, you'll be able to pretend that you don't care that this is meaningless. Think the phrase, I'm just here for a good time. may not be a long time, but I'm here for a good time. I don't believe anyone really believes that. I think we've just distracted ourselves enough to pretend that life isn't rapidly leaving and death isn't rapidly approaching and that this is it. This is a life of no restraint with whatever pleasure we seek. The kind of answer towards life uh, of seeking only pleasure is to drown out what's going on in life and in the world. And as one commentator puts it, you're, you're drowning the world's problems and your problems in a sea of frivolity. You're drowning yourself enough to pretend that there's not problems in your life. To pretend that there aren't problems in the world, well, I'm just here for a good time. I don't need to solve the world's problems or my problems. This kind of life does not acknowledge pain. That they'll do anything to run from pain or discomfort or any kind of wrong. They just want to enjoy life. Maybe another beer, another party, another show to binge on Netflix. Maybe some more takeout, maybe a few hours of scrolling on social media. Maybe those will soothe the upset feelings that I experience. Maybe if I have a difficult confrontation with someone, maybe it's just easier to make a joke rather than speak the truth. Only pleasure and comfort, never anything difficult or challenging, or painful. Recently, I'm trying to figure, I used, I used to have a solid workout structure at work, but now with Emily's getting a new job, I'm going to be taking the boys to school. I we bought a kettlebell, and I've been trying to work out with a kettlebell. I did it for the first time in months, and I could barely walk. And my friends and I went at work, we have a cafeteria downstairs, and I can't look like the, own, the loser that takes the elevator when my legs work just fine, though they didn't feel like they did. But if I was so afraid of pain and didn't want any pain or discomfort, ever, I wouldn't work out. That when you work out, you have the pain and discomfort of tearing your muscles because that's where growth come from, comes from. Think about that through life. That growth will come. True meaningful growth is always slow. And it's going to be painful. But this kind of life doesn't want growth because that will mean it's going to hurt me. It doesn't want to mend relationships because it's going to hurt me. It doesn't want any discomfort. And Paul, or Solomon, goodness gracious, Solomon says it accomplishes nothing. If you're fine with accomplishing nothing in this world, then have at it. 
then give yourself over to pleasure. But if you're honest with yourself, you are looking for a life of significance and meaning. This is not your answer. Giving yourself only to the high, the pleasure, the, 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 the gaiety, the frivolity, however you want to describe it, that's not it. That's not it. Number two, the second bad answer is achievement. Get all the wins that you can. Now, often, I think in American culture, we are an oscillating fan between appetite and achievement. That we, that we whip back and forth, depending on who you're talking to, between pleasure and hard work and dedication. And often in the same person's life, they'll start with pleasure. They'll start with appetite, giving themselves whatever they want. And then they'll realize, well, this isn't it. Now I'm going to pour myself into my work. I'm going to build my business. I'm going to do what I have to do to find some success, to find some meaning and validation. Solomon says, verse 4, read with me. I increased my achievements. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself and planted every kind of fruit tree in them. I constructed reservoirs for myself from which to irrigate a grove of flourishing trees. I acquired male and female servants and slaves who were born in my house. I also owned livestock, large herds and flocks, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I also amassed silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. I gathered male and female singers for myself and many concubines, the delight of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also remained with me and all that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure for I took pleasure in my struggles. This was my reward for all my struggles. When I considered all that I had accomplished, all that I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile. Did you hear all the things that he did? All these massive, uh, massive building projects of, of gardens and, and reservoirs and trees and he had servants bowing to his every whim, and he had more wealth than we could ever even dream of. Imagine having a park with your name on it, or a hospital with your name on it. Imagine the best house that you can find on Zillow being yours. Imagine, imagine the huge numbers in your bank account. Solomon got all of it. Solomon had all the achievement he could dream of. Our currency today is also health and beauty. Imagine you have the six-pack abs. You have the best body that GQ wants to put you on their cover. Men's Health wants you on their cover. All of the Instagram influencers are just so jealous of you. Imagine that you accomplish all that you want to, that you are the most attractive, the, the, the best uh, body that you can have, the biggest bank account that you can have. Whatever he thought could buy him social capital and achievement in his day, he had. One commentator made the point that he's building gardens. It's almost as if he's trying to replicate Eden, but without God. He wants the beautiful, lavish, fruit-giving garden, but no God to walk in the cool of the day. Now, how many of us are we trying to recreate Eden? How many of us are trying to, with our accomplish, accomplishments, we're trying to build something that will make other people impressed? It's not hard to go on social media or YouTube 
and be absolutely barraged with people trying to buy my program and you'll make money in your sleep. And you follow my teachings that you pay for, of course, and this side hustle is going to make you a millionaire in less than six months. Take this little, like, tummy massager, and in six weeks, you'll have the abs. And just do my program, and the, what, they keep selling you all these things that if you get this, if you get this face cream, if you do this right skin care, if you have this right job, if you buy this car, if you have the watch or the Tesla or whatever it is, if you get all these achievements, all these wins, then your life will have meaning. Is it fair to say that Solomon accomplished way more than we'll ever accomplish? Does anyone even dream of doing the projects that he did? He says it's empty. You can just take his word for it. You can decide right now, I don't need to live a life of achievement. I'll never make it what Solomon made it. And he got there to the end of the finish line and said, hold on. Oh, this was empty. I, I made what you wanted to make, and it was empty. Robin Williams is on my mind. A successful, hilarious household name comedian until a number of years ago when he was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia, where he found out he would lose both his mind and control of his body, so he committed suicide. There's a number of celebrities, a shock, it should shock us, not really if we know the truth, how many celebrities, they had the, the fame, and the, and the girl or the guy, they had the house, the boat, the mansion. They had all of this success. They had the Emmy, the Grammy, whatever it is. And it was empty. It was empty. They, 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 you can just bank on it. And, and I, some of us, I think, in life, we think, oh, but not me. I'll just get just a little bit more and then I'll be content. But enough will never, ever be enough. In chapter 3, Solomon's going to tell us that God placed eternity in our hearts. That, that if you are searching more and more, unless it's eternal capacity, it won't be enough. Now think about achievements. Solomon not only had all these building projects, he also... Even Christ would say was the wisest man to ever live. Which is okay for Christ to say because Christ himself is wisdom. But apart from him, Solomon was the wisest man to ever live. Verse 12, he says, I turned to consider wisdom even. Madness and folly. For what will be the king's successor? He will do what has already been done. And I realized that there is an advantage to wisdom over folly, like the advantage of light over darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool also walks in darkness. Yet I also knew that one fate comes to them both. Even all the... the like you might say, I don't care about the body or the house, but I'm going to have the wisdom and the intellect Solomon's telling you, you're both going to die. The one who lives this life foolishly, the one who lives this life wisely, if this is all there is, they both meet the same fate, which is death. If this is all there is, none of us make it out of here alive. He'll recap all of these Tests. Look with me at verse 15. So I said to myself, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Why then have I been overly wise? So I said to myself that this is also futile or empty or meaningless. For just like the fool, there was no lasting remembrance of the wise. Since in the days to come, both will be forgotten. How is it that the wise person dies just like the fool? 
Therefore, I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing for me. For everything is futile in a pursuit of the wind. I hated all my work that I labored at under the sun because I must leave it to one who comes after me. And who knows whether the fool will be wise or a fool. Yet he will take over all my work that I labored at skillfully under the sun. This too is futile. So I began to give myself over to despair concerning all my work that I had labored at under the sun. When there is a person whose work was done with wisdom, knowledge, skill, he must give his portion to a person who has not worked for it. This too is futile and a great wrong. For what does a person get with all his works and all his efforts that he labors for under the sun? All his days are filled with grief, and his occupation is sorrowful. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is futile. So he is recapping all his discoveries, and he hits us with the cold shower of reality. That if you get all the pleasure, or all the accomplishments, or all the knowledge and understanding, if you get all of those things, whatever you're looking for in life, the reality is the same for all of us. Let's, let's summarize what Solomon just said. Number one, we all die. All of us die. There's a guy on YouTube who he's 40-something, and he's doing everything he can. He has pills and regimens and workout machines. I think like hibernation pods, like spent so much money all this time. He has just the right techniques that he says he's reversing aging. That somehow, his, have, has anyone seen this guy? His metabolic age is 18, that he's younger than his son. He's going to die. Maybe after me, maybe after his own son, but no matter anti-aging you do, he's going to die. We will die. The second cold splash of reality. We will be forgotten. If this is all there is, we will be forgotten. Is anyone else? I am upset. I love genealogy, like the ancestry stuff. Anybody else? So I get these alerts about this new hint that of, of a relative of mine might have be in this census or in this newspaper. If it wasn't for me digging into it, I wouldn't even know my great-great-grandfather's name. Can anyone remember their great-great-grandfather's name? We will all be forgotten. I know this is harsh, but this is what the text says. Number three, our achievements will not last. Our achievements will not last. I remember as a, a teenager, I loved it. Uh, my grandma would drive us around, and she would happen to point out that parking lot, that's where my factory was. Or what, that's, that, that's now a gas station. That's where my neighborhood was. Has anyone done a tour like that? That, that just in her short lifetime, the, the, the places she worked, the friends that she had, the, all the, any of us, your house that you built will be gone. The job will be, as soon as you go, the job will be replaced by somebody else. They'll already have the job posting ready. If you, if you worked really hard, and that's awesome, and I hope you do, I hope everyone has the maxed out 401ks, and I hope you're taking care of, but you leave sums of money for your children and grandchildren, Solomon's saying they may be fools. They, they, they may squander your family wealth. There's no guarantee that the, even the knowledge, the wealth, whatever you pass down, there's no guarantee that it will last, and certainly it won't. Certainly it won't. Because the, the crazy cycle of the world, uh, what is it that easy times make weak men, weak men make hard times, hard times make strong men? 
So even if you give your family easy times, you might be dooming your descendants to weakness. There's, there's no guarantee your achievements will not last. Here's bad answer number three. Apathy. Just live your life. Now, I think here's the problem. I think many of us get to verse 24 and stop. Here, here's verse 24. It says, there is nothing for a better for a person than to eat drink and enjoy his life. And I think we take this as Solomon's final conclusion that if all of this is meaningless, there's nothing better than just to eat, drink and enjoy life. So that's what I'm going to do. Just live my life. And when I say many of us are here, I think evangelicalism as a whole that western Christianity as a whole, we will do anything to be too far into the pleasure category and too far into the workaholic achievement category. I just want to stay nicely in the middle, thank you. I just want to be moderate, thank you. I want to go to work, just do my job, get my paycheck, do what I need to do, spend some time. I just need, just live my life. Whatever makes me happy, as long as it's not too like overly crazy, or I'm not too overly into my work, as long as I stay right down the middle, I'm fine. And I think that's where many of us are, myself included. Just live out. Just hold out and wait for your ticket to heaven to be called. Just live your life. Don't do anything too bad. Just stay right down the middle. Is anyone tempted to be there? Because let me tell you, this too is a false answer for finding meaning in life. I'm just not going not gonna to make any waves, just going to ride the line, just do what I got to do. Is that all that God has for us? Or could there be more? Here's the, ver the, tw the turning point is in verse 25. Because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? Oh, he, he says at the end of 24, I have seen that even this is from God's hand. Here's the turning point. The, the possibility of all of you to enjoy life, the possibility at all that you could find friends or find a spouse or find good work or find any achievement, the, the possibility at all that that's available is only because God graciously allowed it. So he's turning our perspective of even, even asking yourself, how do I find meeting? Even the fact that you have a brain to recognize that, that you have lungs to breathe, air to breathe, a job to do, friends to have, even those possibilities are all because God had grace on you. And he made it possible. So let that turn our perspective. That even if just this, this life of simple joys and pleasures and work is from him, then maybe I want to live my life for him. I wouldn't even have a job if it wasn't for his gracious hand. I wouldn't have the skills or the knowledge or understanding. I would not be here if it wasn't for his gracious hand. And we let that break into hardened hearts. We turn the corner on how we view this life. There would be no pleasure in life. There would be no achievement if it wasn't for the Lord. Most of us want to mind our own business and just get a paycheck, but there is more. Now, pleasure, work, and relationships cannot be bad in of themselves because they're from the Lord. That, that, that pleasure in itself, laughter in itself, it doesn't mean that we should all be stoic, stone-faced, not experiencing any joy or pain or, or anything between or hard work. Hard work and, and labor, friends, all of it is by design of the Lord, but they're not meant to be by themselves. It's not just supposed to be pleasure alone, accomplishment alone, marriage alone, family alone, stuff alone. It's supposed to be that as a reference point pointing us to the Lord. 
So when, when Solomon is a little bit less goth when he writes Proverbs, Proverbs writes to, to his son, the one he's teaching, uh, in, in chapter 24, verse 13 and 14, it says, My son, eat honey, for it is good. Honey, sweet. Taste honey. Have a ribeye. Have some lemon bars, whatever it is, that, that, that's good. He says it's, it's good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. God gave you taste buds so that you could enjoy food, so that you could enjoy honey. But then verse 14, he says, know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future in your hope will not be cut off. Perhaps Solomon heard his dad singing Psalm 119, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That, that, that honey, sweet food, sweet taste, enjoyment is just a reference point to pointing back to the giver. It's not supposed to be the thing that's worshipped, but the thing that inspires worship back to the Lord. Pleasure is good, as long as it inspires worship back to the Lord, not becomes the thing worshipped. Now, the juxtaposition of everything we've been through could be found in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Where, now, this really is Paul speaking. He says, so what, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. You can eat, you can drink, you can laugh, you can have friends, you can work, you can have goals, you can have plans, but whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. It can't be this is all there is, is is for a reason, and that reason is God's glory. Here are three ways to glorify God in all that you do. Number one, is make it a reference point for asking yourself, how good is God? That ribeye steak, how good is God? How, how good is he that I can have this delicious food? How good is he that I can have a good time with friends? How good is he that I could in, enjoy my spouse or enjoy a, a, a joke or enjoy a beautiful sonnet or a beautiful music? How good is God that I could enjoy this? And that, yo, you know, if it goes beyond, if your thoughts are not consumed with how good is God for this, you're worshiping the thing, not the God. That's number one, is how good is God? It should inspire worship in your heart. Number two, knowing the Lord is even better than this. So whatever it is, your friendship, the food, the job, the career, the achievements, Know in your heart that knowing God is even better. Psalm 1611 says, You made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hands. Which Where is Jesus seated? At your right hand is pleasures forevermore. That, that this thing that I'm having, this mint cookies and cream ice cream, or this friendship, or this time with my spouse, or this this good feedback that I got at work, that knowing Jesus is even better. So while this is good, it's, there's something even better. Let's think about friendship just briefly to run it through the categories. Number one, having friends, I can glorify God saying, God, thank you for friendship. Thank you for community. Thank you for relationships. Number two, I can say, these friends are temporary and imperfect. There's an even better friend. So the good parts of friendship I'm going to glorify God for, but there's someone even better than him. God, thank you that you're even closer than a friend. And number three is, a third way to glorify the Lord with whatever you do, is what I'm doing or enjoying, is there any way to use it to help someone else know the Lord better? Whether it's sharing the meal or using what the Lord has given you as an act of kindness or using your voice to share the gospel, is, it, is there any way that other people can know the Lord better? 
Now everything you do can instead of being vanity of vanities, it can be what the Lord Jesus says himself, abundant. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So where Solomon warns you of emptiness, Jesus is offering fullness. Not just a ticket to heaven, which we praise the Lord every day that by his shed blood, we are saved, redeemed, adopted, can't be kicked out of the family. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and we rest there. But Jesus wants you in heaven, but he also wants heaven in you. He wants you to not have to live a life any longer of emptiness, but fullness. This is his offer. Now, we can't say we, don't, we didn't know that living a life where the center of gravity is pleasure would bring us nothing and no meaning or significance. We can't say we didn't know that of the life of achievement and success being the center of gravity would bring us nothing and it would accomplish nothing. Now we know. So the offer is before us. And we also can't have just going the middle of the line, being moderate, not making any waves, that also is empty. Now we know. But Jesus offers life to the full. That, that the job that you work, now this doesn't mean that we all have to become missionaries or pastors, but right now where he already has you, that you can enjoy God's presence you can make God's presence known. You can make God's character and kindness and love known at work. So Solomon will come to the right answer. That it wasn't just eat and drink and, and, and enjoy your life, enjoy your work. Here's where Solomon comes to the right answer. It'll be in not until chapter 12. So he'll take you through the whole ride. He'll take you through an Abba song. He'll take you through all these discussions. That you know, everything, everything, there's a season, turn, turn, turn. They got that from him. Chapter 12, verse 13, he says, When all has been heard. So this whole experiment is now done. The conclusions are in. The conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because this is for all humanity. Remember, this fear isn't an unpredictable parent or spouse. It's reverence and awe, it's Jesus as the center of gravity in your life. That he tested everything, and the only way to find the good life or meaning is that Christ is the center of gravity. So have that picture in your head of the solar system, that you have your plans and your family and your accomplishments, your achievements, your goals, everything, your leisure and your all of it, needs to be encircling around the center of gravity that is Christ. And that your knowing him and making him known is now going to inform every single thing that you do, everything that you enjoy. It's all gravitating around he is. So enjoy the good food, the laughter, your spouse, your work, your friends, your goals, your plans, and your dreams. And boy, work hard. But keep him at the center. So here is meaning and here is fullness. Let your life be shaped by awe of who God is and let Jesus be the center of gravity around which your life revolves. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gracious offer of salvation bought by the shed blood of Jesus that all who come by faith can be adopted and redeemed and brought into your family. But we also thank you now that this, this gospel can change us now and shape our life now, and that you, you bought us not just life forever, but also a life of meaning and significance now, as long as it centers around Jesus. Lord, help us. We need your Holy Spirit in order to live this out. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for what he's done. Lord, we submit ourselves to you. Help us all find meaning. In Jesus' name, amen.
stand and sing the closing song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and